as Israeli airstrikes continue to pound Lebanon. Israel's Prime Minister says Hassan Nasrallah had to be eliminated. Nasrallah was not another terrorist. He was the terrorist. He was the axis of the axis, the central engine of Iran's axis of evil. Also tonight, Rishi Sunak arrives for the Tory conference as a Labour MP quits over sleeves. Liverpool go top with a hard-fought victory against Trotting Club Wolves and... It's not too late. Oasis tees more gigs as their reunion tour goes global. TV News with Gamal Fambalay. Good evening. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu boasted tonight that there is nowhere in the Middle East that Israel cannot reach after confirming that an Israeli airstrike had killed the leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah also confirmed the death of Hassan Nasrallah in an attack on the group's headquarters in Beirut. President Biden has backed the assassination, calling it a measure of justice. While Iran says a general in its revolutionary guard also died in the attack and that there would be revenge. Already tonight, non-essential staff are evacuating America's embassy in Lebanon, while its embassy in Baghdad is besieged by protesters. Our international editor, Emma Murphy, reports from Beirut. The barrage was on a scale not witnessed before in two weeks of assassinations. It seemed likely then, and is confirmed now, that scale was due to the significance of the target. That target was Hassan Nasrallah, leader of Hezbollah for 32 years, wanted by governments around the world, and now confirmed dead. Nasrallah was not another terrorist. He was the terrorist. He was the axis of the axis, the central engine of Iran's axis of evil. He and his people were the architects of the plan to destroy Israel. The Israeli military released footage of the operations room where the strike was guided from, as they confirmed they'd eliminated their number one target in Lebanon. Nasrallah's killing is a monumental blow to Hezbollah, but also to Iran and the proxies in the axis of resistance, which he was de facto commander of. Overnight, the attacks across Lebanon were continuing. Beirut's southern suburbs struck. Again. And again. And again. More than 20 hits over five hours. Strikes by jets and drones, each one part of Israel's wish to defeat Hezbollah and degrade its military strength and stockpiles. Israeli jubilation is matched by shock, grief and anger amongst Hezbollah's supporters who vowed to avenge Nasrallah's death. What form any response would take is still unclear. But his killing has taken the Middle East and the world into a much more dangerous phase. There are very great fears in the West about where this situation is going, but nowhere are those fears felt more acutely than in this region and in this country. The West fear the involvement of Iran and the proxies. Those who believe in Hezbollah fear that they may not get involved. Whichever side of the line you are on tonight, this is an incredibly dangerous time for this region. Emma Murphy. ITV News, Beirut. Well, world reaction to the assassination has been swift. Robert Moore is in Washington for us tonight. And Robert, uh, what has the White House had to say about uh, Israel's actions? Well, both Joe Biden and uh, the Vice President Kamala Harris have issued nearly identical statements, fully backing Israel uh, for the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, calling it a measure of justice for Hezbollah's many victims, including hundreds of... Uh, of Americans. Strikingly, no reference in that statement to the collateral damage or to the fate of uh, ordinary Lebanese uh, in the Lebanese 
uh, capital. And that may come at some political price to the U.S. It ties the U.S. to uh, Israeli escalation, even as paradoxically uh, the White House is calling for de-escalation and a ceasefire. And indeed, tonight, as you pointed out, there are protesters marching on the uh, U.S. embassy in Baghdad, and there's been a, a partial evacuation order of the U.S. embassy uh, in Beirut. And in the last few minutes, President Biden has just told uh, reporters that a current uh, U.S. reaction and response is underway to Houthi missile attacks against U.S. Navy ships in the region. So on multiple fronts, there is alarm in the U.S. that this is quickly spiraling out of all control. Okay, Robert in Washington for now. Thank you. Conservatives are gathering for the start of their party conference in Birmingham tomorrow with far fewer MPs than attended the last one. And they are already buoyed by the news that an MP has quit the Labour Party, blaming sleaze and cruel and unnecessary policies. Our political correspondent, Shihab Khan, is in Birmingham for us this evening. And Shihab, first of all, uh, what do the Tories hope to achieve there? Yeah, well, this is the first party conference that the party has held in opposition for 14, 15 years. So it will be a slightly different feel. The former prime minister and the current conservative leader is already here, Rishi Sunak. But ultimately, the focus of this conference is going to be who is going to replace him. There are four candidates still in the running. Tom Tugendhat, James Cleverley, Robert Jenrick and Kemi Badenoch. And this is essentially a big audition for them. They'll be attending a lot of events throughout the next few days, trying to win over those voters, those Conservative members who will be voting to make sure that they end up as the leader. The Conservatives I speak to, everyone that I speak to, basically says there isn't a standout candidate at the moment. There isn't anyone who's really pushed far ahead. This is going to be a huge test for them, but also a big opportunity. There's going to be a lot of discussion about how to rebuild the party after that general election result, but also about attacking the government in particular when it comes to things like the freebies rail and the winter fuel payments rail. So a lot on the agenda. Yeah, and uh, Shiav, spirits must have been raised there by the news of the Labour MP's resignation today. Yeah, this was a slightly shock, shocking moment, especially given the size of the Labour majority. But Rosie Duffield has long time, have for a long time, has been clashing with the Labour Party on a number of issues, in particular when it comes to transgender issues. But she's also been very critical about the party's position on winter fuel payments. She was very vocal publicly about that. But also, when it comes to freebies, in her resignation, she's been very critical of Keir Starmer and the way in which the party has taken to government. So it is definitely something that we'll hear quite a lot about as conference here goes on. Shehab, thank you. without power after Hurricane Helene swept through the southeast of the United States. The storm left a trail of destruction extending hundreds of miles from Florida to Virginia. Callum Fairhurst reports. Streets flooded, houses swept away. Oh my God. Dozens dead, thousands homeless. Hurricane Helene has left its path of destruction across America's southeast. In Florida, the state first to be savaged by its 140 mile an hour winds, many have lost everything. This was where our home was. This was where we lived full time, right there. It was a big two story blue and white house. Nothing remains of Ashlyn's house. The only thing they have left is each other. It's very devastating, like we all grew up down here. And um, like my grandpa, he passed away and that's all the memories we have are down here. And it's just so sad. The winds have been weakening, but warnings remain in place. Many in Asheville in North Carolina are among the millions who've lost power, and the risk of flooding remains. While in Tennessee, this century-old dam hadn't ever seen water levels like it. Oh, good. I'm going to go see if I can help this lady out a little bit more. Meanwhile, in Atlanta, this weather presenter interrupted his broadcast to save a woman stranded by rising floodwaters. And there is Bob carrying her out. Although Helene has now weakened, experts say there's still a risk of heavy winds, flooding and tornadoes. Thousands remain in shelters with nothing but the mammoth task of rebuilding ahead. Callum Fairhurst, ITV News. The flooding in Nepal's capital, Kathmandu. More are missing, and the government has asked all police officers nationwide to help with rescue efforts. Heavy downpours have been pounding Kathmandu since yesterday, are expected to continue into tomorrow. 
And Ukrainian officials say Russia has attacked a hospital in the northeastern city of Sumy, killing nine people. They say the building was attacked twice, with the second shelling happening as emergency services arrived. On to football, and Chelsea's Cole Palmer became the first player to ever score four goals in the first half of a Premier League game as they beat Brighton 4-2. And Liverpool are the new Premier League leaders tonight. They won 2-1 at Wolves to go a point clear of Manchester City, who were held to a draw at Newcastle. Chris Gudder has more. After a scrambled draw against Arsenal, some think City's Achilles heel might have been exposed. The loss of Rodri through injury leaving a gaping hole in the team like the one ripped through Haaland's sock. But even without one of their star men, Josko Vardiol's goal at Newcastle was picture book City. A win would have kept them top, but they reckon without England's Anthony Gordon winning a penalty and then scoring it to leave City dropping points again. That left the door open for Liverpool to leapfrog them at the top by winning at Wolves. Arna Slot couldn't believe that one didn't go in, but if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, and Canati's head did the rest. The Liverpool boss could scarcely have believed what he saw next, some keystone cops defending, allowing Wolves to equalise. But it was Kamikaze defending at the other end that settled the match. Penalty, there. penalty to Liverpool. It is. And Mo Salah finished the job. Six games gone and Liverpool are a point clear at the top. Chris Scudder, ITV News. And finally, if you missed out on tickets to the big Oasis reunion tour next summer, there's new hope, but you'll need your passport. The former feuding Gallagher brothers have appeared on billboards in at least four American and Canadian cities, teasing a big announcement on Monday at 8 a.m. New York time. It's almost certain to confirm the dates and locations of the band's North American tour, adding to the 19 dates already sold out in the UK and Ireland. Oasis is also expected to announce gigs in South America, Asia and Australia next year. And that is it. The uh, weather forecast is next. But from all of us here on the weekend news team, many thanks indeed for watching. A very good night. Bye bye.